think that in societies like Bahrain, the kind of oppression that people are faced with on a daily basis is very much like being suffocated. Feeling of the first time you breathe. And it's not something that can ever be recreated. In the late evening, I received a call from my wife telling that there was a statement by the Ministry of Interior requested in the Bahrain TV listing 31 Bahraini citizens, their national has been revoked and my name was there. Ten years on, what we know today is that the repression has succeeded. Ten years ago, the beginnings of a popular uprising gripped the Gulf Kingdom of Bahrain. The country's Shia Muslim majority had long felt persecuted and sidelined by the ruling Sunni royal family. But their would-be revolution never got a chance to flourish, because within weeks, a Saudi-led intervention would help the ruling family to quell the movement. The fact that Bahrain is a small country and the fact that it um, is one of the reasons that perhaps it wasn't given the attention it deserved. Uh, and I say deserved because if you think proportionally, it was probably one of their biggest uprisings in terms of a percent of the population uh, in modern history. In 1999, Hamad bin Isa al-Khalifa ascended the throne after his father's death to become Bahrain's ruling emir. The country had undergone a period of protracted unrest in the 1990s, which was met with a widespread crackdown by the ruling al-Khalifa dynasty, which has ruled Bahrain since 1783. In 2002, Hamad declared Bahrain a kingdom and proclaimed himself king. He promised reforms in a new political opening under the National Action Charter. But in the following years, the opposition would accuse him of backtracking on key reforms. When a series of anti-government uprisings erupted across the Arab world in 2011, Followed by a sweeping euphoria when protesters in Tunisia and Egypt succeeded in overthrowing their autocratic rulers, many in Bahrain were inspired to hold protests of their own. On the 14th of February, thousands of mostly Shia Muslim Bahrainis took part in marches across the country. By the next day, two men had already been killed by riot police, leading thousands to occupy Pearl Roundabout an iconic landmark in the capital, which came to symbolize this uprising. I think one of the feelings that I remember very, you know, in a very stark way is the feeling of when we first took over the roundabout, the Pearl Roundabout. It kind of felt like we had been held underwater for a long time. And this was the first time that we had come above water and taken a breath. That feeling that we had actually taken the roundabout, that people were writing whatever they wanted and holding it up like that, that feeling of saying, you know what, if I'm thinking it, I'm going to say it and I'm not going to self-censor. I'm not going to think about the consequences. The growing turnout would eventually exceed the organizers' expectations and the protests were eventually regarded as the largest in the country's history. As the crowd swelled at Pearl Roundabout, they initially called for social and democratic reforms. But as the violence intensified, many would later chant for the regime's downfall. What happened at that point is that people decided that there was something that was more important than their fear. That's what shifted. It's because people had hope. And of course, we were very quickly pushed, you know, pulled back underwater afterwards. On the 17th of February, just three days after this nascent uprising started, security forces armed with tear gas, rubber bullets, pellet guns, and shotgun rounds stormed the roundabout. At least four protesters were killed and 300 injured. They called it Bloody Thursday. 
all the time, you know, I could hear the screams behind me. I could hear, I could see the smoke of the tear gas like everywhere. It's a huge white cloud. I could hear the shooting. We had one person who was literally shot with a tear gas canister execution style. When he was brought to the hospital, half his head was missing. By the end of that week, at least seven protesters had been killed in total. Bahrain's Crown Prince Salman bin Hamad would soon order the withdrawal of troops and security forces from the streets, calling for a national dialogue with the opposition. All political parties in the country deserve a voice at the table. As the army withdrew, tens of thousands converged onto the roundabout, with organizers estimating the number of protesters at over 100,000. At the time, the population of Bahraini nationals was estimated to be 500,000. But I think the effect of the 14th or the 17th fight was just to provoke people further uh, and to, to kind of underscore the idea that the, the government weren't willing to actually uh, have a dialogue. And I think that was key because I think even to some extent there's always this hope when you have an uprising that the government is going to accede to some of your demands and the brutality of the the, the response just, uh, I think, it, it sort of told people, listen, if we don't mobilize, then we're not going to get our demands. So I think it really galvanized people, and that was embodied in the sacrifice of the people killed. On the 14th of March, troops from neighboring Gulf states, mainly Saudi Arabia and the UAE, rolled into Bahrain at the ruling family's request. Four days later, Pearl Roundabout was torn down as the government declared a state of emergency, moving quickly to crush the uprising. Hundreds would be arrested in the coming months, including opposition leaders and activists. The repression and the crackdown has targeted not just during the protest, but to this day. Oh, it targeted union leaders, it targeted journalists, it targeted activists and peaceful protesters in general. So it did target a very wide range of profiles of people. One of those arrested in 2011 was Jawad Fayrouz, a former member of parliament and leading member of Al-Wafaq, the country's main and largest Shia opposition group. Spending more than three months in custody, Fayrouz was tortured, partially held in solitary confinement, and placed before a military court. They beat me a lot, and they took me to a person who had been, they, they used to call him Sheikh. And it was so clear that he's one of the ruling family members. And here, a real, uh, uh, and let me say, a very frightening torture type by him uh, uh, applied on me. He hung on uh, his, his weapon toward my head. He started beating me, using so many bad words, so many, let me say, uh, 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 very threatening words against me. And such type of the torture, which is aerial applied, was to keep me in an isolated cell, to let me to kiss the photos of the uh, ruling family members who are in government, like king, prime minister, and mainly, and uh, 24 hours I used to stand and continue forced to kiss their photos. And there was a dog behind the door of the cell and they opened the door and they wanted to let the dog to come in if I didn't continue uh, their order to stand up and so on. Fayrouz was released in August of 2011, after which his case was transferred to a civilian court on charges related to his participation in the protests. During a trip to the UK in 2012, the Bahraini government broadcast a list of 31 Bahrainis whose citizenship had been revoked. Fayrouz was among those listed, instantly becoming stateless. So, who have authority? to revoke the nationality of someone like me, who is Bahraini, who was born in Bahrain, whose parents are Bahraini, who never ever had any other nationality, and they dare to revoke my nationality without even giving any justification and even not to be through a court to, to let me to defend myself. لا نتطلع إلى محاكمة الجميع. 
In July 2011, King Hamad established the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry to investigate the reports of violence and abuses which occurred during the uprising. An effort by the government believed to be aimed at appeasing protesters and signaling an image of reform to Western allies and international rights groups. The BICI report published later that year documented 46 deaths between February and April linked to the protest. It accused authorities of being responsible for at least 19 of the deaths. Over 550 allegations of torture were recorded, in addition to the dismissal of over 4,000 public and private sector employees over their support for or participation in the protests. The Commission submitted 26 recommendations to the government. This is why a lot of people are in two minds about the BICI report. At the same time, it was important. It's an important record of what happened. In many cases, a very good record of what happened. But at the same time, it's also served as a means of exonerating the regime by giving the illusion that they're transparent and accountable, when in reality, very little has been done since that report was released. Or very little lasting reform has, has, has occurred. Many of those killed, uh, whose deaths were documented in the Bahraini report, their cases were dismissed immediately with the lack of evidence. While Bahrain's crackdown attracted harsh international criticism, Bahrain's Western allies were sharply rebuked by rights groups for not holding the kingdom accountable over the violent suppression of the protests. Both the US and UK boast strong bilateral ties to Bahrain and the country hosts the U.S. Navy's 5th Fleet, as well as a permanent U.K. military base. In the past years, we've constantly, as Amnesty International, we've constantly called on Bahrain's Western allies, especially the U.K. and the U.S., to raise its voice and to condemn and to use the leverage it has with the Bahraini authorities to improve its human rights record, to release prisoners who have been languishing in jail, to revise its, uh, its course of repressing dissent. Um, and unfortunately, this has been to no avail. We have not seen any signs of condemnation. There is always going to be economic and security interest, and a lot of times that's going to take precedence, whether it's in the United States, the EU, the UK, or otherwise. And so looking at it from that lens, it's actually not surprising that there wasn't an adequate response to the human rights situation in Bahrain, and that's where they always fail. Again, the EU, the US, the UK, they talk about human rights, they talk about democracy as being the cornerstone of their foreign policy, but they will never apply it to their allies where it matters. Reconciliation talks would eventually collapse as the government's crackdown intensified in the years following the uprising. Major political groups, including Abu Falk and the secular liberal Wa'ad Party, would be dissolved and banned. Their members would also be barred from standing in any parliamentary elections. This despite a claim in 2011 by then Foreign Minister Khalid bin Ahmad Al Khalifa that Bahrain was not looking to dissolve political parties. In 2017, the government shuttered Al Wasat which was widely seen as Bahrain's only independent newspaper. It had been running for 15 years. 10 years on, what we know today is that the repression has succeeded. Most of the activists, most of the vocal persons, most of the independent thinkers are even, have been driven into silence, they're locked up, or they've been driven into exile. So it is a very sorry state today and incredibly sorry for Bahraini individuals who have fought, who have hoped for a better future and who have been paying a, an incredible price with their own lives for, for their fight for freedom. The Sunni-led monarchy has constantly refuted accusations of discrimination against Bahrain's Shia citizens. Are Shias in your country mistaken when they argue or they allege that there's systematic discrimination against them in terms of jobs? Are they? That's a question for you. I don't know. I've never heard this argument, except in one another. It's always been in Bahrain. Today, however, reconciliation with the opposition has remained largely paralyzed. The government dismissed the uprising as an Iranian plot to undermine the country. 
though the BICI report never found evidence of this, it prosecuted hundreds in mass trials, sentencing some to death. In 2017, three men were executed over their alleged role in a bomb attack which killed three police officers. Two years later, another three were executed. In 2020, death sentences were upheld against two activists, who rights groups have said confessed under torture. And some of these trials were met with very concerning allegations uh, uh, you know, of torture being used in detention and during interrogations to extract confessions that were then used in the trials and based on which verdicts were issued and per people and individuals have been sentenced. With the opposition mostly disbanded, dozens of opposition leaders have been jailed, exiled, or silenced. The situation in Bahrain today, I would say, is worse than 2011. There might not be the same kind of physical violence that we witnessed in 2011 and, and the couple of years after that. But we have a situation today where the main tool of oppression is the justice system. I think the underlying grievances that uh, facilitated the uprising in 2011 haven't necessarily gone away. Um, and so when we have a younger generation, uh, you know, as the population continues to expand, you'll have a younger generation who probably have the same grievances. And I imagine we, we probably will see something similar, um, maybe not in the next five years, but maybe in the next 10, 10 years, certainly. I don't think it's necessarily forgotten because we exist and we're still talking about it. But I think it's an ongoing thing. I think these movements, you know, the uprising in and of itself, yes, that may have ended. But I think the movements don't die. The movements continue and it's, it, it falls back to that idea of you can kill the people, but you can't kill the idea. The idea lives on and I think that idea has been living on and will continue to live on.